Welcome to the Dr. Ramsey Show, sponsored by Revitalize Functional Medicine. If you're looking for health tips released consistently every week, you've showed up to the right place. We're grateful that you're joining us, and now your host, Dr. Teresa Ramsey. Hi, I'm Dr. Teresa Ramsey, and welcome back to the Dr. Ramsey Show. Today, I'm going to share with you my passion. For the last 21 years, since 1999, I've been studying the research on hormone replacement therapy, and that is my specialty. And my book will be coming out I think this fall, unless it's delayed, we are in the second of three edits, and this is my manuscript. And what I'm gonna share with you today is the chapter on breast cancer. There's a lot of confusion on the safety of hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer outcomes. And most people believe that taking hormones increases your risk for breast cancer, and that couldn't be further from the truth. So I'm gonna share my book, my chapter with you. I'm just gonna read it to you, and this chapter is called Breast Cancer. As of this writing, one in eight women older than 50 develop breast cancer. Breast cancer has increased fourfold between 1970 and 2014, up 242% compared to the population increase of 56% over the same time frame. The older a woman is, the more likely she is to get breast cancer, with the rates of breast cancer being low in women younger than 40. Fewer than 5% of women diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States are younger than 40. Rates begin to increase after age 40 and are highest in women older than 70. Breast cancer is the most common type of diagnosed malignancy in this and the second leading cause of cancer death in women around the world. All of these are referenced as well that you'll be able to see when the book comes out. Anovulation or lack of ovulation and low levels of serum progesterone have been associated with significantly higher risks of breast cancer in premenopausal women. It is common for women diagnosed with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome or insulin resistance to not make progesterone, with many studies already presented in the PCOS chapter, which is an earlier chapter in this book, polycystic ovarian syndrome. To take this notion a little further, as we learned in the PCOS chapter, women who take synthetic progestins have a significantly increased risk of breast cancer. Synthetic progestins where were what was used after learning that menopausal women with a uterus required a form of progesterone to prevent uterine cancer instead of bioidentical progesterone. I'm not sure why bioidentical progesterone wasn't used in most studies as there is a bioidentical progesterone available on the market. Even before, I'm gonna share with you this study that came out in 2002. In 1989, Dr. Hargrove put bioidentical progesterone on the map. Why they didn't use progesterone as one of the arms, I think is um, very unfortunate for this study. In contrast to synthetic progestins, menopausal women who replace bioidentical progesterone have a lower risk of breast cancer than women who don't replace progesterone. Let's use the WHI study again, and that's the study I was referring to that came out in 2002. The WHI study demonstrates the the difference between hormone regimens and breast tissue. The following quotation comes directly from a paper published in JAMA in 2002 called A Critique of the Women's Health Initiative Studies. In quotations, the purpose of this paper is to point out problems with the data analysis and conclusions drawn by the authors of the Women's Health Initiative. The WHI was a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial to examine the effects of estrogen plus progestin on various health benefits and risks in postmenopausal women. The trial was designed to last for 8.5 years, but was stopped at 5.2 years because the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute accepted the study's Data and Safety Monitoring Board evaluation that the risk of breast cancer were increased and other health risks of hormone treatment were greater than the benefits. This paper reviewed just the PremPro arm, the synthetic estrogen plus progestin. In fact, there were three arms of this study and the PremPro arm was the only arm that was forced to stop early due to the risks outweighing the benefits. The other arms were not stopped because the benefits of Premarin compared to placebo were significantly greater. 
Here are the risks that were listed in the article, remembering if the relative risks are above 1.0, the treatment worsened the condition being studied, in this case, PremPro, on the following tissues. Invasive breast cancer went up to 1.24. Heart disease went up to 1.29. Stroke went up to 1.41. And pulmonary embolism, or a blood clot in the lung, went up to 2.13 with PremPro. We do not see that with bioidentical hormones. By contrast, Estrogen alone, Premarin, use by postmenopausal women with a prior hysterectomy in the WHI trial did not substantially interfere with breast cancer detection and statistically significantly decreased the risk of breast cancer. That's Premarin. These women were not exposed to progestins and had much different outcomes overall, not just on breast cancer incidence compared to placebo. Here's a summary of the article. Synthetic progestins have been associated with risks of breast cancer and venous thromboembolism, or blood clots, while progesterone, bioidentical, has not, leading to a high demand for hormone therapy containing bioidentical progesterone. The take-home is that synthetic progestins increase the risk of breast cancer, while estrogen and bioidentical progesterone reduce or lower the risk of breast cancer. Gambrell's review of the WHI wrote that estrogen can safely be given to women with a history of breast cancer, as in the WHI. It showed a 9.4% recurrence in women treated with estrogen only compared to placebo where there was a 20.3% recurrence in breast cancer. This means that women who took estrogen had a much lower recurrence rate of breast cancer than women who did not take estrogen. Not only did Premarin arm of the WHI have a lower risk of breast cancer and all cause mortality, but the longer they were on Premarin, the lower their risks became. A 2008 study published in European Journal showed no risk of breast cancer with the use of estrogen plus bioidentical progesterone, but a significantly increased risk of breast cancer with the use of estrogen plus progestin. The article goes on to say, the choice of progestogen component in the combined hormone replacement therapy is of importance regarding breast cancer. It could be preferable to use progesterone. In fact, progesterone is the only steroid hormone that has been shown to be free of carcinogenicity in controlled clinical trials to date. That was published in JAMA. An article that came out in 2012 states, it has been argued that in 10 years since the WHI, many women have been denied hormonal therapy, including those with severe symptoms, and that this has significantly disadvantaged a generation of women. Due to the confusion on interpreting certain articles, sadly it seems that only the negative studies get the media's attention. Not only were women denied support for menopausal symptoms, but they have been missing out on a lot of protection like reducing the risk of breast cancer, heart disease, dementia, and osteoporosis. Here is a way that you can remember how different synthetic progestin is from bioidentical progesterone. Women cannot carry a baby full term unless they make an abundant amount of progesterone. It is our progestational or pregnancy hormone. A woman who does not make adequate progesterone levels will experience frequent miscarriages. The risk of miscarriage in women who don't make progesterone is three times higher than that. The risk of miscarriage in healthy women. Quote, breast cancer incidence in women with a history of progesterone deficiency, quote, was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 1981. This study separated women into two groups. Both had infertility for different reasons. One group consisted of women who were infertile due to hormonal deficiencies, progesterone deficiency, and the other group of women were infertile due to the re other reasons, and they were labeled non-hormonal infertility. These two groups of women were followed for 20 years. The women who had progesterone deficiency compared to non-hormonal causes of infertility suffered a 5.5 increased risk of premenopausal breast cancer. What does this mean? Women who are premenopausal, premenopausal, not yet in menopause, who don't make progesterone had a significantly higher risk of breast cancer compared to women who made progesterone. These results are astonishing and directive to clinicians who want to make a difference in breast cancer statistics. It is very rare to get breast cancer when young. However, when progesterone is not being made, the risk of breast cancer raises substantially.
Another thing they witnessed was that women in the progesterone deficiency group experienced a tenfold increase in deaths from all types of cancer compared to the non-hormonal group. The data is so very clear. We can protect women. We can help them have babies. And yet progesterone is feared by all gynecologists in the valley where I live. My patients from out of the state say the same exact thing about gynecologists in their part of the world. They won't give progesterone, and if they do, they will only give 100 or 200 milligrams, which to me is a very low starting dose. The reason for this is that the organization that sets all the standards for hormone replacement therapy for women is called the North American Menopause Society, or NAMS. They mentioned bioidentical progesterone in their 2012 position paper. They stated, the dose varies based on the progestogen used and the estrogen dose, typically starting at the lowest effective dose of 1.5 milligrams of medroxyprogesterone acetate provera, 1.1 milligram of norethendrone acetate, and 0.5 milligrams of drosperinone. And then the very last thing they recommended was or 100 milligrams of micronized progesterone. Why that wasn't put first and only, I really don't know. Lastly, vitamin D also plays a big role in protection. When D3 is deficient, it accelerates breast cancer growth. Pakistani women tend to have the lowest vitamin D levels in the world and have really high breast cancer rates, and it is suggested to evaluate vitamin D regularly in these women. Overall, this chapter is designed to help you think logically about the difference between younger and older women and the significant difference in breast cancer rates. In addition, simply aging in itself is risky for breast health. Then, moving beyond logic, we can recognize the broad research database available for us that validates when hormones go deficient, the risk for breast cancer goes up, and when they are replaced, the risk goes way down. These are the studies that need to be broadcasted and not simply the PremPro arm of the WHI, which showed that risks of HRT outweigh the benefits when synthetic hormones are used. So thank you for listening. It is my passion to help women reduce their risk of breast cancer, stop fearing breast cancer, especially when there's a genetic risk in their family. Many women come to me who have had breast cancer in the past, who need to be on hormones for their quality of life and risk reduction, and it is extremely safe. So that's just what I wanted to share for a take-home message for all women to start appreciating because it's not well accepted in the community, unfortunately. But my practice mimics the outcomes of studies, and I am grateful to say that I have only seen breast cancer six times in my 25 years of practice, never in a patient that went back on hormones after breast cancer. I've not seen one recurrence. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for um, accepting my passion for my career, my specialty, as it gives me tremendous joy. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us, and stay tuned for our episode next Tuesday. Stay healthy and happy. Until next time.